Hello everybody, this is going to be another video in my series on slavery in the antebellum period of the United States. Um, this is going to be largely inspired by the last book that I read, um, very interesting book by the way, titled The Gray and the Black, The Confederate Debate on Emancipation by Robert F. Durden. Here it is right here. It's published in the 70s in Louisiana. Not a very big book. And what this is really interesting about this book is the author himself has written very little in it. Um, it's almost entirely uh, contemporary documents, uh, newspaper clippings, um, declarations, letters uh, between various people, especially in the South, Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee, um, politicians in the South. You know, so to just give an example, like there would be like right here, you see this section right there that's the text from the author and then everything that follows is a contemporary thing and this is basically just setting the stage who's writing it when they wrote it uh, he's weaving a narrative to be sure but he's letting you know the southern southerners speak on not just southerners but almost all southerners talk about it um you know when i first picked it up and started to read it, i was like ah, i don't know if i if this is going to flow it flowed very well and you get basically principle, you know, direct, this is what these people thought. Now, people would probably hear the title and wonder, or the sub, the subtitle, and wonder, wait, the Confederacy had a debate on emancipation? I thought emancipation was something uh, that the North did and that it, if anything, inflicted on the South uh, punitively, which it did. Um, and Yes, there was a debate on emancipation in the South, although it was largely indirect. There weren't abolitionists in the South. There were no people in the South who were saying that, uh, well, I don't know to say if there were none, but there were very few people in the South who were advocating the end of slavery as a goal in and of itself. However, once this war started and then very much towards the end, there became the realization that the South needed the manpower, it needed soldiers, and by having such a large proportion, nearly half, the population of the South was about 9 million, about 4 million were slaves. If we assume that ratio for men, which may be a slightly different, it means four-ninths of the male population that could be in the military was basically couldn't be in the military because they were slaves. Um, I and mean, when you're talking about a country that's already outnumbered, uh, you know, two and a half, three to one, that's not a, a good situation. Um, and so throughout the course of the war, it became suggested more and more, and eventually from the highest sources, that uh, slaves should be um, allowed into the military, either voluntarily or compulsorily, and that it made sense if that were to happen that those slaves should be emancipated. and not only those slaves, but probably their families as well. Um, and a few times, several people, um, several prominent people um, even, went to the extreme of saying that all the slaves should simply be emancipated uh, as a war measure. Um, fascinating, fascinating reading. Um, it, it displays a whole lot uh, about how Southerners felt about slavery, but what I found most interesting and what I kind of want to approach the angle is, is not the emancipation debate itself, which is itself interesting, but what it demonstrates about secession and that what the priority between owning slaves and independence from the Union and which one was more important to Southerners um, and to put the, the, the conclusion at the start, uh, based on what I've read in this and based on what ap appears to be the case with at least many people, independence was far more important than slavery and to the point that they were willing to end slavery and sacrifice slavery in order to gain independence. Um, there probably were people who didn't feel that way. Um, there is allusions made in this to the possibility that there were some Southerners who, especially late in the war, when they were it was likely that they were going to lose, maybe started hoping that maybe they could have peace if they could ob obtain submission to the to the Union and keep their slaves, they might be willing to do that. But there were very few people who felt that way or at least felt uh, comfortable enough talking about it. It was apparently an unpopular enough position that there's very little, if any, writing up to that effect. 
Um, now, one thing I don't want to say is that the Southerners didn't value slavery or didn't think very highly of it. The Southerners were very enamored with slavery. It was part of their culture explicitly on, you know, they, they said so themselves repeatedly. They almost define their culture in this way. And so many people today like to say, well, look, so yeah, I mean, secession and um, slavery must be linked, but the two are not, uh, they're, they're not mutually exclusive. You can, you know, secede for other reasons and still believe in slavery. There's lots of things Southerners believed in uh, with as much totality as slavery. And that does and people don't go around saying, for instance, that secession is purely Christian because uh, the Confederates were all Christians and very religious because they were, um, you know, I mean, I'm sure they're not all, but like overwhelmingly Christian. They believed in Christianity. They believed in the Bible. They believed in God. They also happened to believe that, uh, you know, there are many of them anyway, that Christianity lined up with slavery, but people don't go around saying, well, secession is just a Christian dogma and, you know, the South did everything it did because of Christianity, but they do say that in terms of slavery. And again, slavery, very, very important. I'm always, and people will love to throw around uh, quotes, and I know there's a famous one by, um, was it uh, Stephen Toombs? I forget. He was the vice president of the Confederacy. But he basically gave a speech where he said, you know, the great foundation of the Confederacy is the truth of Negro slavery, the inferiority of the Negro to the white race. Um, which again, doesn't prove that secession is only about slavery, but it's kind of interesting that somebody could take a quote like that and say, there we go. It's, um, it's can't be debated anymore because that would be analogous to taking a campaign speech from Joe Biden and saying, America is this because the vice president said this once. Um, you know, if Joe Biden gives a speech and says that we need to have you know that guns are bad and that no one should own them and or which he has never said but just hypothetically and that uh you know uh, the the truth about america is that we want universal health care you could quote that and while he's a he's a vice president he's a important you know a public figure um so wouldn't want to dismiss or completely discount him having said that but it doesn't prove that the entire country is motivated by that exact same ideology or has that same um, you know, uh, motivation. Uh, and likewise, you can't just take, you know, the view of the vice president of the Confederacy and say, well, now everyone must believe this because we can point to other people uh, in the Confederacy, including people who are quite frankly, much more prominent than him, who uh, apparently thought that slavery could be abolished in the Confederacy and the Confederacy could go on without slavery and that independence uh, without slavery was preferable to uh, remaining in the Union, even if you got to keep slavery. And at the top of that list would be Jefferson Davis, who is the president, and also Robert E. Lee, who is probably the most famous, most influential figure uh, in Southern history. And I could list uh, a whole host of other ones. So um, very interesting. So early in the war, um, the South did fairly well um, in several spectacular battles. Uh, especially in the east in Virginia, um, not initially Robert E. Lee, but the Army of Northern Virginia did very well against the various incarnations of the Army of the Potomac. Um, in the west, the Confederates did mar markedly less well, and there was a steady strategic advance of the Union in the west. Uh, New Orleans, which was by far the largest and most economically important city in the south, was taken in 1862. Um, you know, Tennessee was essentially overrun in 1862. Uh, the Mississippi River was basically cut off for in, ter for in terms of the Confederates being able to use it in 1862 and 1863. Um, for some reason, there's a lot less prominence placed on those because the so the armies involved weren't as big, the, the clashes weren't as titanic, um, and there's a very Eastern, inf um, not myopia, but perspective in, in the Confederacy, just because that's where most of the people live. Virginians in Richmond uh, are going to be much more interested in what's happening 150 miles away in Maryland or in Northern Virginia than they are stuff that's happening in Vicksburg uh, or, or Shiloh or, uh, you know, uh, New Orleans. Um, but early in the war, um, there wasn't a really strong impetus to end slavery. There were a few people who said this is going to be a problem for a couple reasons. One, 
um, the labor thing. We, we are outnumbered and we are basically taking four ninths of our population and saying they can't be in the military. Um, is that really wise when we're already outnumbered more than two to one? Um, second, um, European states can't be associated with a slave power. They were pinning a lot of hope uh, on as England and France, particularly um, aiding the Confederacy. And it talks about this uh, as kind of another interesting side issue. Both in the North and the South, there were widespread expectations that this was going to happen at some point. Uh, early in the war, there was an incident called the Trent Affair, where uh, the Union blockade intercepted a Confederate ship that had, or a, excuse me, it, uh, intercepted a British ship that had two Confederates who were going to be like counselors, who were going to negotiate in, in the UK. It abducted them, and this was, you know, considered an act of war. Essentially, this would have been considered an act of war had it been a lesser country. Um, it was. A big deal. Uh, there's a lot of fear in New York. Uh, Horace Greeley has, um, there, there's quotes in his journal about a lot of uh, the Wall Street crash because people were worried that England was going to declare war. That didn't happen. The Union actually turned the counselors over to Britain and they ended up going uh, to the UK. There's a lot of feeling that because of uh, the textile industry in in the UK and its dependence on southern cotton that they would you know, rally to the support uh, of the Southern cause, and also that there was a cultural affinity there that, you know, Englishmen were more aristocratic and, and noble and that, um, and, and cavalier and the Southerners were the cavaliers and the Northern Puritans were the roundheads and there was some natural affinity and perhaps there was some affinity, but slavery was a dead letter. And there were those in the South who said, we should abolish this so that there's a, at least a chance that um, some of these European states, especially the UK and France, uh, will acknowledge us. Uh, and this was feared that this might happen in the North. Now, uh, he, uh, he quotes some writings in, in, from London, uh, one in particular, and I'd, I'd never read this before, um, to the effect that that will never happen. From the English perspective, whatever they may have thought about the Confederacy or slavery or whatever else, they would never have supported it because it would have meant a war with the Union, with the federal government, and they were all terrified of a war with the federal government. Even even when the United States was engaged in a gripping titanic civil war, nobody in Europe, including the most powerful states, wanted to mess with the federal government. Um, which isn't to say that they would be invaded and occupied by the Union, but only that, uh, well, they would have been. I mean, Canada would have been immediately, uh, had the UK gone to war with the US during World, uh, the Civil War, Canada would have been invaded like that and taken over. Uh, and British, uh, the British mer mercantile fleet would be <laughs> mauled worse than it was in World War One or World War Two. To be perfectly honest, in fact, the Union Navy actually came out with um, ships that cl clearly were m made with the intent that they would be commerce commerce raiders, and I think it was meant, and 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 the the threat wasn't lost on 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 the UK that you don't want to mess with this conflict because if you will it'll be very bad. And so, you know, uh, somebody writing in the London Times saying there's just no way we're ever going to come out on the side of the Confederacy. Also, since the North is most likely to win, we would be making an enemy forever, even if we didn't get involved. But, uh, but there are those who thought in the South that, uh, that's a side topic, an interesting one, by the way, but um, that freeing the slaves would help with the Europeans. There are also those who thought it would help vis-a-vis -vis the Union, because many people in the Union were saying, you had, on the one hand, some abolitionists who were very eager to go to war with the Confederacy, although abolitionists d d varied in how they felt about this. Many abolitionists favored secession and thought that there should be no no union, quote, with the slave power. This would include people like William Lloyd Garrison, probably the paramount abolitionist. People who thought for slavery to exist, it had to have this uh, hinterland of uh, non-slave owning, but... Uh, obligated to help slavery, um, you know, area, and that without subsidy from the North, slavery couldn't exist. They didn't all agree on that, but that was part of the impetus. Also, a lot of Northerners, even if they weren't abolitionists, thought, look, these these Southerners, they, they, they say this is about independence, but it's not about independence. They're just greedy slaveholders. 
and the idea being if we free our slaves, it would basically be saying, uh uh, it's not about that. It is really about our independence. This really is like the American Revolution. Um, in which case, don't be a hypocrite and stop us from, don't be King George in this case. Um, questionable how much that would have mattered, but there were people in the South who thought that it might be worth doing. Um, now, through the course of the war, as the casualties mounted and the number of soldiers that the Confederacy could muster decreased steadily, whereas in the North, they really didn't. Um, and that came from two reasons. A, the North was able to import a lot of soldiers from Europe because they did not have a blockaded country unlike the South. So you have entire brigades and regiments and divisions being raised by Irishmen, by Germans, by other immigrants who were coming to the United States. The other thing that was happening is as they were invading the South, uh, they would f not necessarily free the slaves, but they would um, recruit many of the slaves, whether voluntarily or involuntarily. The, many people in the South seem to think that the slaves were essentially being drafted into the Union Army. I don't know if that's true or not. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. I know some were joining voluntarily. Some of them may have been coerced. It's unclear. Some of them may have been almost effectively coerced. But either way, uh, the North was raising, in the end, over 200,000 soldiers, uh, black soldiers, most of them who were coming from the South and former slaves, although there certainly would have been freemen from the North there as well. Um, and many Southerners pointed out, this is silly. We have this small pool of resources and we're actually allowing the larger, more powerful state to use our population against us. Wouldn't it make more sense if we were to use them against them? And, and so by 1863, 1864, these became pronounced questions, um, especially after things like the Battle of Gettysburg. It was strategically maybe not that important, but ideologically in terms of people's uh, eagerness to war and their, their estimation of how serious the war was, it was very important to follow Vicksburg um, it became much more pressing. There was a, a very interesting document pa um, published, written by a very influential and popular uh, Confederate general by the name of Patrick Claiborne. He, from Ireland, he'd moved to the U.S. Uh, to the South in the 1840s, took up the Southern cause, and he wrote a very long article. And he, and he had all of his generals sign it, and he sent it to to Richmond, and he basically said, "We need them. They'll do good soldiers. The North has proved this." Uh, but also the only way that will give them an incentive to fight is to give them freedom. We can't have them be slaves and, and say, okay, you have to fight for us. And then once we win or whatever, you go back and you be a slave again. He goes, that will never work. They have to be set free. And if we set them free, but not their families, that's not going to work either. So there has to be that. And probably also some kind of gift of land. Um, and this is kind of brings up an interesting point because it strikes at the heart of how the Confederates thought about the justifications for slavery because there were some who said okay let's let's just make them fight up for us as slaves and because to admit that they would respond to incentives that they would have a desire to be free I mean the the whole rationale the moral argument for slavery was that it's for their own good they they deserve to be where they are God placed them there they're under our tutelage. They're not capable of being free. They don't really want to be free. We take better care of them than they would be able to take care of themselves. Um, and, you know, they're, they're effectless. And uh, there are also a whole bunch of arguments that they wouldn't make good soldiers, uh, which apparently was incorrect, but they still, you know, thought that. Um, and the idea that they might respond to the incentives to be free was something that kind of contradicted a lot of the uh, rationales for slavery in the first place. And so there were many people in the South who refused to admit that. And they would just say, look, uh, you know, we can't do this um, because and some even acknowledge, like if we admit that emancipation is something that could be used to motivate slaves, if we can, if we ha if we admit that the manumission of a slave is something that they're interested in, and they actually want, then they the whole idea that they ought to be slaves in the first place is put into question. And there were those who accepted that and said, so maybe we should question it. Far more common were people who said, I'm not going to look at, it was too much cognitive dissonance for a lot of people. And they said, no. However, in terms of the secession independent slavery debate, it is very clear that many of them said, look, I love slavery. I want slavery. I think it's right. But if in order to achieve our independence, we have to free them then we should do that. And we should do that without hesitation. And many, many, many people believe that. Most of the debate actually was not 
what that, that that's what would need to happen most people agree that if you did uh put them in make them soldiers you would need to emancipate them many people question whether that was actually necessary many people thought we can win the war without turning to slavery and in 1862 and 1863 um you know it's it's understandable why many people would have thought that because some of the confederate armies did very well in the field especially the army of northern virginia again much less so in the west but and and i mean it's interesting most of the stuff in this the debate is happening in the fall like november october december of 1864 and the spring of 1865 all the way right up until march of 1865 which for those of you who don't know lee surrenders at appomattox in april of 1865 so people were having this debate very very late in the war uh which is one of the things that struck me because in, in my just kind of thinking, I thought the writing was on the wall much earlier than that. But no, there are many people in the South saying, yes, we should free our slaves if it's necessary, but it's not necessarily. Surely we have enough soldiers to, to fight the war. There was a lot of absenteeism. There are a lot of people who were not in the army who had deserted. Uh, and it was felt that maybe if we just got rid of some of the exemptions, if we forced these people to come back, we'd be able to have enough soldiers. Um, that's a, a practical argument to say, well, it's not necessary to free the slaves um, for our independence. We can stay independent without freeing them. But for anyone who acknowledged that not freeing the slaves would lead to a, the loss of independence, then they would say, free the slaves. And many of them made point to, and it was interesting because when Jeff Dav Jefferson Davis was one of the most, uh, he was definitely the most prominent, if not Lee, um, one of the early I want to say converts to this idea is like we we need to do this and if you know if, if it's the honorable thing to do if they fight for our freedom if they serve the country to give them their freedom um, at least as individuals now many people acknowledge well if you if you enlist 200,000 and the estimates were there were about 600,000 military age slaves in the confederacy at least at the start of the war there would have been fewer towards the end after much territory had been lost 600,000 have they been fully mobilized which is dubious whether that could have happened but let's say even half if 300,000 of them uh had been mobilized that would have been a huge increase to the effective fighting strength of this of the confederacy and one that's like it's almost insane that they wouldn't have gone there um uh, but they well they did at the very very end but they they waited much much too long um so you know davis is saying look obviously if we manumit you know, 200,000, 300,000 slaves, even if we don't manumit their families, but especially if we did, the institution is going to be basically lobotomized. It's going to, that, that would be a catacly cataclysmic um, uh, event in the history of slavery, but we should do it anyway for our independence. And many people pointed out, look, and this is something I've said, and this is something I was aware of, look, slavery wasn't in danger when we seceded. Uh, the North was not going to end slavery. Abraham Lincoln never threatened to abolish slavery he said so many times repeatedly in all like all his campaign speeches he didn't want to touch it he would to, to preserve the union he would do whatever it took regarding slavery um except i guess extending it everywhere was like the line that he drew which would not affect people who already owned slaves um when jefferson davis started saying he wanted these slaves to be put in the military either voluntarily uh, or or even through conscription, which was an interesting kind of idea. They were already conscripting both whites and property. The Confederate government was a, was much more interventionist than the North. It had essentially become socialist. It was socializing agriculture, industry, and labor. And it was interesting that they could go to a you know a white person and say you're drafted, and we're taking your property, your draft animals, your wagons, your food, but they couldn't take slaves. Who are both human and property and they talked about the distinction that a, a slave is both property but it's also a person you count them in the census but you count them in your assets and it's yeah um but wouldn't them wouldn't that make, make them both you know susceptible to the power of the state especially in an emergency like a war but many of davis's critics actually pointed out the stuff he's trying to do his attempt to take the slaves is more than abraham lincoln ever tried to do Abraham Lincoln never tried to take the slaves until after the war started. And even then, he waited until the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, and that's a good, uh, such an ironic example that people, oh, the Emancipation Proclamation approves that the North is fighting a war for slavery. 
No, the Emancipation Proclamation, if you read it, and it's very short, so you can read it in just a few minutes, um, exempts all areas that the North had conquered. So the entire state of Tennessee, the state of West Virginia, as it eventually became, all the counties in Virginia that had been occupied, all the parishes in uh, Louisiana that had occupied, uh, the number of slaves that existed that were alive in this area was something like half a million, uh, and they were all exempted. Uh, furthermore, it says that anyone who comes back to the Union uh, and swears allegiance to the Union, they can keep their slaves too, and they have until January 1st of 1863 to do it. Um, so clearly, uh, you know, rejoining the Union and sacrificing independence but keeping your slaves is what Lincoln wanted, and this is what people pointed out, that Jefferson Davis was going farther than Lincoln. Now, after the war had gotten to a certain point, the North was like, hey, there are hundreds of thousands of soldiers that we could raise here. It's more punitive. Uh, I think they also realize we're going to win. We can just dictate. You know, we don't have to try and persuade the Southerners to come in, come back. They're coming back because we're going to win. And I think that's one of the reasons you get things like the Thirteenth Amendment, uh, and and that's one of the not the only reasons. I think there also was a kind of an idea that, look, this has been a big war. Something has to change because of it. And the obvious thing to change, and honestly, I can't argue with this. It should be slavery, but that's not the same thing as saying the North went to war to end slavery, or that's the reason that motivated them primarily. No, that's an effect, not a cause. It's like saying FDR went to war to end the Holocaust. Complete bullshit. Did the Holocaust end because of World War II? Sure it did. That's not why the Allies got involved. Uh, and to give them that moral credit, I think, is completely undue. So... Fascinating, fascinating. These uh, were saying, look, Jefferson Davis is an abolition. And that was kind of a smear in the, the political back and forth that had dominated in the South and the North for so many years. In the South, calling someone an abolitionist would be like us calling somebody racist. Uh, and, you know, oh, they want to free slaves. And, you know, they many arguments were made. Uh, for instance, it was usually considered if a slave saved your life, that it was good form to manumit them. Uh, and the analogy was then given, if these people are going to s help save the country, then we should manumit them. And, I mean, then there were, of course, you know, Southerners who thought, no, no, you can't, uh, private property, the state can't intervene uh, with slaves, although they didn't feel the same way about other things generally. So they'd say, oh, yeah, take my horse and my cart, take my sons, take my relatives, take all my money. Don't take my slaves. There were people, especially in like South Carolina, Georgia, Robert Barnwell Rett comes to mind, one of the early fire, fire breathers, people who were just never touch my slaves no matter what. And and those people, I think, <laughs> and there there's a practical argument here. There are many people who are like, we love slavery. We want it to persist forever. If we lose the war, we're losing our slaves anyway, either because the tumult of the war will allow them to escape or, or they'll be drafted into the Yankee army. Or in a punitive effect after the war, the North will dictate some kind of uh, emancipation for everyone, uh, which was true. If we use the slaves, we might end slavery anyway on our own terms, but we'll still be independent. And what's very fascinating is the vast majority, every, every person that he cites anyway, who makes that realization that failure to utilize slaves does mean losing the war, especially when you're talking about 1864, um, 1865. They unanimously make that decision, and it's very fascinating. You see the change in the newspapers in the spring of 1865 from this is something we're skeptical about, this is a big deal, we should really think about this, to like, we need to do this now. Um, way too little, way too late. They started raising um, uh, Negro companies, training them uh, in Richmond and a few other places. Uh, Robert E. Lee sent a letter to Jefferson Davis on April 2nd, 1865, saying, I'm glad this is finally going. I mean, it literally was the last week of March that finally the legal rules, and it's complicated because the states and the Confederacy had to assent to a large degree. The powers of the federal government, the Confederate government to, to do anything was hampered to an extent. They got the state of Virginia to finally acquiesce. Um, some of the other states had, in, uh, had shown interest. And uh, they started raising companies and Lee sent a letter in April 2nd, like, okay, this is it's good that this is finally happening, but like, it's a little too late. And also it looks like there may be enemy movement. Uh, so I'm going to be busy. And then he actually telegraphed, uh, Richmond later that day and said, you need to evacuate, uh, because we can't hold the city anymore. And I think he surrendered an Appomattox on the 12th, 10 days later. So 
I don't know if um, any of these units of Negroes that were raised actually fought. Uh, there were Negroes who fought for the Confederacy for sure. They ended up being there. There were units of Negro militiamen in, in both Virginia and Louisiana that are cited here that at the start of the war laid their services at the, you know, said, we're here to help the South. We want to fight for our homes. Uh, and we will. Uh, presumably this happened. I've heard estimates of somewhere like 90,000 Negroes ended up serving, and I'm just using the term because it's contemporary, um, ended up serving in the, to one capacity or another in the Confederate forces. Actually, Thomas Sowell um, tells a great story about growing up. Uh, when he was a small child, when he was five, his great grandfather died, the, you know, the, the patriarch of the, of the family. And he was very young. He remembers the funeral and this, this old man who, you know, this was been in the thirties, but he'd been, this was a very old man in the thirties who had just died. He had, it had been his wish that he'd be, he'd, he'd be buried in full many military honors and regalia. And he was wearing the uniform of his country, which was the, the, the Confederate gray with a Confederate flag. He was a Confederate, uh, <laughs> which is like cognitive dissonance to the extreme. But, you know, many, many Southerners, look, these blacks are from the South. Their country's getting invaded too. Their places stand to be annihilated. And if we can offer them an incentive, um, like you can be free afterwards. And, and just by simply even acknowledging that they might res respond to that incentive kind of Put the nail in the coffin for the the moral case for slavery for a lot of people, which is why some people refuse to admit that. And there, it's funny because one one published article is like, no, we can just, you know, they can volunteer that the, uh, the, their master can give them away. This their wages will go to the master. They'll have to fight in you know the army and face death and whatever privation. And then when they're done as a reward, maybe we can let them pick whichever master they like, and maybe they can bring their family with them. Uh, and it was just a joke. And, and many of the people who responded, and they're it's fascinating because the, this book will show an article and then show the res response article and so on and so forth, uh, would be like, you've got to be kidding me. They're, they'll never do that. Why would they do that when they can go to the Yankees and they'll just get their freedom anyway? Um, so interesting, interesting uh, book. Uh, really a joy to read. I wasn't sure uh, what to expect from it. Um, I loved the fact that it used primary sources. Uh, the letters and the newspaper articles uh, gave you a real sense of the dialogue and the personality of these people. Um, and again, and I was shocked at how late this debate was really, I mean, the debate, Jefferson Davis started making serious efforts in the fall of 1864. Basically his idea being we're, we're, de we're desperate now. Things kind of slow down in the winter. When the spring starts, the, the North is going to have a massive, massive army and we're down to a fraction of our starting strength. Uh, and if we could raise whatever, 50,000, 100,000, eventually the most common number that they kind of hoped for was 200,000. If we could draft them into the military in, in the fall, in October and November, we'd have the, the, the winter to basically drill them, train them, and come the spring, they'd be ready to be, to be used. Um, as it turned out, um, there was so much political haggering going on and so much opposition that it didn't happen until, like I said, late March. Um, and also there's something to be said here for the um, out of touchness of legislatures, because the fact that you had people in Richmond in February and March of 1865 saying, it's not necessary. We really don't need slaves. We've got enough men. Everything should be fine. It's not that serious. I don't, I don't know how that impression could possibly exist. Um, I guess, of course, that's looking back from hindsight. Um, but, you know, they didn't have, I mean, there was some control of the press. There was a lot of people who wrote, and I didn't know this actually, but there were a lot of people who wrote in Southern newspapers who were actually military officials. What did they call it? He, he had a term for that. But they basically, the military officials would publish articles, but it wasn't secret. And they weren't the only people publishing stuff. And I don't know to what degree if any censorship was going on. Um, but for people in the legislature should not be censored, but the, they were, I mean, they were clearly, I don't want to say clearly, because I don't know what their perspective was. From my perspective, they were clearly, and again, that's to say my perspective looking 130 years back and whatever, but um, completely out of touch. Like they had no clue how serious the situation was. I mean, this is after 
for those of you who don't know the chronology exact, you know, the spring of 1865, this is way after the Battle of Gettysburg, way after the Battle of Vicksburg, after Sherman's march to the sea, after his march into North, uh, South Carolina, um, you know, uh, Grant has now spent an entire year just hammering Robert E. Lee battle after battle after battle after battle after battle. Uh, port after port, all the major ports. Um, I think Wilmington uh, was the the last major port to fall. Um, you know, serious, serious situation. You know, the, the North had already not only freed, but incorporated 200,000 slaves into their own our own military you know the hour was indeed very very late and you know like well let's go on recess and we'll talk about it later maybe maybe we can uh maybe we can get maybe five thousand to be cooks and you know drive the wagons and stuff uh wow like this and, and again the, the more prison people had called it right from the start in fact he talks about the governor of louisiana he was particularly hit by this um because he was the governor of Louisiana, you know, New Orleans was occupied by the Federals early in the war. Um, he was apparently one of the largest, if not the largest slaveholder in the South. And he wrote a letter to Jefferson Davis and like, we need to, we need to free all the slaves right now because we need their, we need their support in the military. And we also need that in terms of having something to talk to with the European states, because we're going to need their help. Um, and unfortunately for them, uh, that never, it, it, I mean, again, I can't say never because, you know, two weeks before Lee surrendered, you know, they started to draft, but it was much, much too late. And, and actually, they, they put it very early. They didn't want to draft them. They wanted it to be voluntary. They basically would say, let's go to the plantations and say, who wants to join, you know, join your country and you'll be free afterwards. And they were raising people to do it. If they had started doing that at the start of the war, it's a very interesting question. What would have happened? Um in terms of strict manpower, would it have made a difference? Not likely, maybe, but when you start doing the ripple effect of, in terms of the motivation of the Union, in terms of European powers, could it have made a difference? Uh, it could have, it's hard to say. Um, you know, you can never, we'll never know for sure. What it does demonstrate though, in the, in the dialogue that took place in the back and forth, that they were clearly willing to sacrifice slavery um, if it meant independence. And that the idea of, Losing independence but keeping your slaves, which is something that Lincoln was offering, at least until 1863, was completely out of this, out of scope. Now, this again is not to say they didn't believe in slavery or didn't value slavery or didn't define themselves in terms of slavery. It's just to say that they valued independence more. And I think that uh, even if there are some Confederates who would have, well, we should have just stayed in the stayed in the South as part of the Union and kept our slaves. This during the war, there were apparently almost no one who was willing to actually say that. Now, maybe that's both during the war and they don't want to seem like a traitor. I've never encountered that. You know, if anyone has read a document of a Southerner saying it would have been better for us, everything I've read of, of Southern, from the Southern perspective is that they're glad that they did it, that they're proud and that they think that this was something they should have done and had to have done, even though it meant the end of slavery. Um, so again, it's not to justify slavery. It's not to say that they weren't, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, uh, racist or that they weren't uh, very pro-slavery or that slavery wasn't an important issue, an important uh, instigating, um, you know, uh, point of contention between the North and the South because absolutely it was. But to say that they valued slavery over independence is wrong. In all the cases that I've seen, and you know, again, if someone has seen a case other than that, let me know. Um, and but certainly in the higher ups, I mean Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee. Of course, who Robert E. Lee didn't own any slaves, so he didn't have a dog in that fight. He's one of the most outspoken people in favor of the idea, by the way. Um, and in fact, it was his his testimony and assent to it which ultimately turned the tide. Although much too late, once again. So, anyway, good book, fascinating, short read. If you want to read a whole bunch of um, contemporary documents, you know. Uh, it's a good place to look, and uh, I think that's it. So I'll talk to you all later. Bye-bye.